Hello and welcome to EngPhys 2 PO4 Lecture 18, Elasticity 2, Poisson's Ratio, Bulk Modulus, and the Stiffness and Compliance Matrices Relating Axial Stress and Strain. Poisson's Ratio expresses the idea that as you compress a beam, it tends to extend in the other directions and vice versa. If you were to pull a beam, then it would constrict in, it, in the other dimensions. So what this means is that in general, the stress and strain along all three axes, let's say X, Y, uh, y and Z, are coupled together through a factor called nu, which is the Poisson ratio, dimensionless number. Now, looking at this equation, you can see an example of this. So we've got our x strain is not just dependent on the x stress over Young's modulus like it was earlier. Now, if there's a y stress, then we may find that we get a different x strain. So let's look at this. If we've got a tensile stress in y, we're extending the 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 beam in y. Then we may then what would we expect? We expect that it would go in in the x direction even if there weren't any x stress and that's why there's a negative number here so ex epsilon x is equal to some factor which is going to be increasing as the x stress increases but then also decreasing as the y stress increases or as the z stress increases writing this equation in matrix form we come up with this expression this is just a representation of Hooke's law so see we've got that the deformation is equal to some constant times the stress. Poisson's ratio for almost all materials is between 0 and 0 0.5. Steels and polymers are typically around 0.3. Cork has an interesting Poisson ratio on one end of the spectrum of 0, while rubber has a Poisson ratio on the other end of the spectrum of 0.5. Think about what those mean. If a Poisson ratio is 0, it means that if you were to compress it or extend it, then it doesn't change at all in the other dimensions. So in cork, the, ac the axes are basically uncoupled. Whereas for rubber, you've got the maximum amount of coupling. Rubber manages to retain volume when you compress or extend it. We'll look at some examples of that. So all of this discussion, this matrix here, where we've got the same new written in all of the components that have it, and we factored out E, is only really valid if the Young's modulus and the Poisson ratio are the same for all the different directions in a material, which isn't going to be true if the material has a lot of crystal asymmetries. So for more complicated crystals, that's uh, that's not going to be the case. And we'll have to look at the, uh, consider the fact that Young's modulus changes in different directions and Poisson ratio changes in different different directions. That's going to be necessary when we look at piezoelectricity. But for now, when possible, we're just going to take the simple case of materials that are either amorphous or have the, the right kind of crystal structure to be isotropic. So the same in all different directions. Check your understanding. For a material with a typical Poisson's ratio of about 0.3, since stress and strain in other axes can affect the stress and strain in X through the Poisson's ratio, is it ever actually fair to say that epsilon X was equal to sigma X over E like we did in lecture 17? So at the beginning of this, we talked about uh, cork has a Poisson ratio of zero, so it's true there that as you, uh, as you apply a stress in X, then it it's the only thing that's responsible for the strain in X. It doesn't lead to a strain in Y and Z. And that's how we were dealing with things last lecture, where we just said all of the stresses were proportional to just the strains in that axis. So we didn't have to look at what the other axes were doing. Now the question is, if we have a non-zero Poisson ratio, is it ever possible to say that epsilon X equals just sigma X over E? Well, yeah. So you don't need nu to be zero. That's one option. But you can also just have the some kind of boundary condition where the stress is forced to be zero in the other dimensions, which is the case if the beam is unconstrained. Example, tensile cube shape change and volume change. Suppose you apply a tensile stress in the x direction to an otherwise free cube of side length L, isotropic Young's modulus E, and Poisson's ratio nu. Calculate one, it's new dimensions, and B, it's change in volume. Here's a picture illustrating uh, kind of a hint of this. We've got a cube, and we are, uh, we are going to be pulling on it, applying a, a tensile stress in the x direction here. And you see that as a result of that, it's shrinking a little bit in y and z, or actually a lot by this, by this picture here, and extending in the x direction. So green is the original cube, red is the the new rectangular shape that we've got by doing this, and use the equations above to figure out the new dimensions and the change in volume. Okay, so to do this, first thing you're going to have to do is figure out the strains using the Hooke's Law expression that we had up here. 
give that a shot, and then try and figure out the rest of it. So here it is, Hooke's Law Expression, substituting in the fact that it's unconstrained in Y and Z, because it was an otherwise free cube. We can come up with what the strains in uh, X, Y, and Z are. And then, since strain is the delta L over L, we can figure out the new dimensions of the cube as the original plus their change, or their original times one plus the strain. Substituting in the numbers that we found for strain, we'll find the new x, y, and z dimensions are this, and the new volume is just the product of these three. Now usually the strain is, uh, is kind of small, so we'll take that the terms that we get proportional to strain squared can be dropped. So we'll ignore those strain squared terms and just get L cubed times one plus epsilon x, epsilon y, epsilon z. The volume change then by simplifying this is the original vol is the new volume minus the original volume, which gets rid of the one. So we've got that it's L cubed times the sum of the strains. And well, we know the strains, right? So if we were to substitute in the strains that we found, we'll get that it's equal to L cubed times the stress divided by the Young's modulus times one minus two nu. So look at this, the length change was an L sigma over E, and now the volume change is kind of like the same thing, but L cubed, original volume rather than original length, and except that we've got this other factor, one minus two nu. This gives us another feeling for what the Poisson's ratio is. Two nu is how much more the object resists changes, changes in its volume than changes in its shape. So rubber with a, a Poisson ratio of about, of about 0.5 is infinitely more resistant to changes in volume than it is to changes in shape. You can easily deform it, but it takes up nearly the same total space. So it's resistant to volume changes, which we'll look at soon, called the bulk modulus, is going to be a lot higher than its Young's modulus, which is a resistance to shape change, really. For cork, nu equals zero, it doesn't really resist changes in volume more than shape. You can compress or extend it in any one axis, but the, uh, and the volume change is just whatever it needs to be to make that one axis change. Okay, another version of a very similar problem. Suppose you take a three meter by one meter by one meter steel beam and apply a 200 mega Newton force to each end of the long section of the beam. So to the side that's three meters, let's call that X. Calculate the deformation of the beam if the beam is otherwise free. This is very similar to the last problem, except now we've got actual numbers. So you could just substitute into the results that we got there if you like. Okay, so here's our solution. Substituting into the same Hooke's law, we come up with a stress of 200 megapascals. Strain ends up being one E minus three, and the length change of this three meter long beam for that strain is three millimeters. So the strains in Y and Z, it was a little bit shorter there, and it's got a Young's uh, Poisson ratio rather of 0.3. So both those factors end up making the length change in that dimension smaller. It only reduces by 0.3 millimeters in that dimension. So the beam deforms to three millimeters longer in X and 0.3 millimeters narrower in Y and Z. This is, uh, these are real numbers here. So this is the actual Young's modulus of steel because Young's moduli for a lot of materials that, that you're uh, typically going to be dealing with are very high. You'll find that materials don't actually move that much and the, uh, the change in other axes dimensions are typically small compared to the change in the main axis. So the length change in X here was 10 times the length change in the other axis. Now true, the, the X was three times as big, but that means that because of the Poisson ratio, we're still going to be getting about a factor of one third the change in those off axis components. Follow up question, what's the deformation if we apply a one mega Newton force to only one end of the otherwise unconstrained beam? So rather than applying it to both the X dimensions, so positive one mega Newton on the right and negative one mega Newton on the left, if we just don't hold the beam at all and we apply one mega Newton to the right end, now what's the deformation of the beam? Well, zero, it's just gonna accelerate in that case. Now, if you were to do this in a fast, in a fast situation, you might find that you'll get a, you'll probably get a wave of deformation 
as the information of the force showing up travels down its length. Imagine that you're gonna kick a water balloon to get some idea of how this uh, how this applies. If you apply like a, or maybe slap a water balloon, you'll find that a deformation from that is going to travel in a wave across it. Bulk modulus. Under a uniform stress on all faces, like a pressure, an object undergoes the same strain in all three dimensions, assuming that it's made of an isotropic material anyway. And it's more convenient to refer to the volume change and volumetric strain, which turns out to be negative the pressure divided by k, where k is defined as the bulk modulus. This is a material parameter. The reciprocal of the bulk modulus is called the compressibility. So bulk modulus is kind of like resistance to compressibility, or maybe the incompressibility of the material. You can relate the bulk modulus to the Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio if you're going to solve, if you solve the uh, uniform pressure problem using axial stress and strain. So a pressure is like a negative stress. So if we were to replace the stress in all of these in this uh, Hooke's law expression with a negative p, because pressure is applied inwards towards the material and we defined compression as negative in this equation, then we can solve for what the strains are. They turn out to be the same in all the three dimensions, not surprisingly, since it was an isotropic material and we have uniform loading on all the different sides. From our work in the last section, the relative volume change is the sum of the strains, at least for small strains. So we can say that the, uh, the relative volume change ends up being, by summing these, th negative three P over E times one minus two nu. Compared to our definition up there, of the bulk modulus, you can see that the bulk modulus is just E over three times one minus two nu. Okay, exercise. Calculate the bulk modulus of rubber, copper, and cork in terms of their respective Young's moduli. And then use your results from A to determine the fractional volume change of each material in response to a pressure of one one hundredth their Young's modulus. P is equal to one percent E. So you don't need to look up any Young's moduli to do this because it's all in terms of their Young's modulus. Okay, so using this definition of bulk modulus that we found here, uh, the, really the definition is this equation. The, this is a calculation for bulk modulus that we found using the, the Hooke's law and substituting in our negative pressure. We can figure out what the relative bulk moduli is for these three materials. So for rubber with its very high Young uh, Poisson ratio, we end up with a very large relative bulk modulus. Copper has a Poisson ratio about the middle of the road. Bulk modulus in relative terms is about one. And cork with its Poisson ratio of zero has a bulk modulus in relative terms of only 0.333. So uh, the relative volume change in response to a pressure of one one hundredth of their Young's modulus is about only six parts in, uh, in 10 to the six. 0.01, so the same percent as, their young, as the Young's modulus for copper, and 0.03, three times the Young's modulus. This is because in cork, we change by the same amount by 1% in all three dimensions. By co for copper, we change by a total of about 1% because the bulk modulus ends up being about one. And for rubber, it's much more resistant to these volume changes than to length changes. So its bulk modulus ends, is a lot higher than its Young's modulus. Okay, now as a follow-up exercise, what uh, try and rank these three materials, rubber, copper, and cork, in terms of their compressibility. So remember, compressibility was the inverse of bulk modulus. The trick here is we didn't say relative compressibility. Right, so you probably should be skeptical saying that uh, that rubber, although it has a much higher relative bulk modulus than copper, that it actually has a higher bulk modulus than copper. In fact, it doesn't. So here's the reason. Rubber has an extremely low Young's modulus of only one megapascal. Cork ends up having a pretty low mo Young's modulus as well, about two, uh, 20 megapascals, whereas copper has a Young's modulus of 120 gigapascals. Because of this, even though it's its relative bulk modulus is lower than rubber's, its actual bulk modulus is about 70 times higher. So it's, uh, so rubber is about 70 times as compressible as copper is. Cork, on the other hand, even though it does have a Young's modulus that's higher than, uh, higher than rubber, uh, 
its Poisson ratio was so much lower than rubbers that its bulk modulus is still lower than rubbers by about uh, a factor of what's that 270. This means that it's about 270 times as compressible as rubber. Stiffness and compliance matrices. So this improved hook law relation we've been using uh, again still says that strain is proportional to stress. This is the one we've been using, except that the proportionality constant is a matrix because there's three axes of strain and three axes of stress. This matrix, including the E, has a name. It's called the compliance matrix because the more compliant the material is, the more it's going to move in response to stresses. Compliance matrix is given the symbol S. Now, just, be, just to be completely ridiculous, I don't know why it's given the symbol S, uh, the, the inverse of the compliance matrix is called the stiffness matrix, and that's given the symbol C. This is not a mistake. Stiffness is given the symbol C, and compliance matrix is given the symbol S. It's, it's ridiculous, and it's silly. I'm not going to apologize for that. This is, uh, this is <laughs> worse than parking in a driveway and driving in a parkway. So this is, if you, if you are ever in a position to change this, then please do that. I, uh, I don't want to give you the wrong information. If you look in literature, then you're just going to find that this is pretty ubiquitous. It's all over the place. S is for the compliance matrix, the thing in this expression, and C, the inverse of the compliance matrix, which would be how you get the stresses from the strains, is given the symbol C, the stiffness. Okay, so let's calculate the stiffness matrix. We're just going to invert this. And you can use maple to do that. If you like, here's some code to type in a matrix in maple and then take the inverse, matrix inverse, who would have thought? It shows up like this. But let's rewrite that because nu is greater than, uh, ooh, that's a typo. Should say, because nu is less than one, it's usually better to write this like this. And so here's how you'll see the compliance matrix written. If you have the strains and you want to solve for the stresses, then you can just multiply a matrix here rather than having to solve three equations and three unknowns, and this method is easier in that case. Okay, let's make some observations about these matrices. So here, here's the equations back to back. The off-axis terms in the compliance matrix here are negative, but the off-axis terms in the stiffness matrix are all positive. So are the axial terms. This seems like it's a little asymmetric, doesn't it? Like the inverse of this matrix that has all negatives off the axis is positive everywhere. Doesn't that mean that like if we've got all positives here, then we're going to get all positives here. And if we had all positives here, then we won't get all positives here. Well, no, not quite. It's uh, that, that's not how the matrix multiplication works out. There are still negatives. It's just they show up differently. And uh, so you've got like minus V's here, and here you've got one minus V. So overall, the terms are going to show up the same. This is just the same three equations rearranged from the original version. Now let's look at some, uh, some examples of some loading conditions to consider this. Uh, if you were to just solve for the X strain, where we have zeros in the other axes, then we'll find that it's sigma X over E. But if we solve for just the X stress, with the zeros in the other axes, then we'll find that it's that the relationship between stress and strain is now uh, is now e over one plus nu times one minus nu multiplied by one minus nu times epsilon e. So the material has tensile stress in all three dimensions. So look, uh, just to rephrase what's going on here, if we have no stress in the other axes, then we'll find strain in all three dimensions. But if we have no strain in the other axes, we'll find stress in all three dimensions. Now, because of the off axes components here being negative and here being positive, it seems a little bit strange that if we apply just an X stress, we've got strains in all three dimensions, but Y and Z ones are negative. But if we apply just an X strain, then all three stresses are positive. Isn't that weird? Well, we have to think about how stress and strain are actually pretty different and what would be happening in these two situations. If you apply just stress in the x direction, then the material 
uh, and no stress in Y and Z. That means the material is free to move in Y and Z. So what's going to happen in that situation is exactly what happened for this cube up here. We pull it in X and then it's going to shrink in Y and Z. But now for the other situation where we apply uh, not a stress in Y and Z but a fixed strain in Y and Z and restrict it from moving in the other axes, now what happens is we're holding the cube out to this size and imagine that we hold it out there and yet pull it in the other dimension to make it longer. If we're somehow magically holding it to be just as big in the other dimensions, then those dimensions are going to want to shrink. So they're going to have a tensile stress showing up from that forced strain of zero. What about the X direction then? What kind of stress does it get? Well, if we pull it, then it gets a tensile strain as well. So if you apply a fixed strain and force the other axes to have no strains, that's why you get positive stress in all three dimensions. Now, here's an interesting corollary to this example. Even if you're only concerned with what's going on in X, then the apparent stiffness, though, so the way that stress is related to strain, the proportionality constant for that, depends on what the material is doing in the other directions. So if the material is free to move in the other directions, then we find that strain is equal to stress over E. And if the material is fixed in the other dimensions, then we find that stress is equal to E over 1 plus nu times 1 minus 2 nu times 1 minus nu multiplied by strain. So this proportionality constant is not just E like it was if it's free in the other dimensions. So the, uh, the work that we were doing in the last section really was only valid if the material is not constrained in the other dimensions. That's the stuff from lecture 17. And you, if you look back, you'll find that all of those examples were free in the other dimensions. If it's fixed in the other dimensions, then you find that the material actually has an apparent Young's, moduli, Young's modulus, which is different. It's got an effective stiffness, which is, uh, which is actually bigger. It's a little bit hard to tell by looking at it, but this factor is greater than one. We can calculate what that is for a number of different quantities to see how much stiffer the material appears if you constrain it in the other dimensions. So if nu is 0.01, then the effective one is, uh, is hardly bigger at all. If it's 0.3, then it's about 30% bigger. But as nu approaches 0.5, the value of rubber, then it goes towards infinity. So it gets infinitely stiffer if you stop it from being able to move in the other two dimensions. One more topic for today, 2D simplifications to 3D problems, plane stress and plane strain. There's a lot of material we've covered today, but it's going to pay it's going to pay dividends later on when we have a bit of an easier time with some of the future sections. So plane stress and plane strain are common boundary conditions in, uh, in finite element method solvers. It's situations that you can set up to solve your problem in two dimensions. So if you're ever going to look at a stress strain problem in 2D, you have to assign either plane stress or plane strain. Plane stress is the condition that the perpendicular direction, so the z dimension, if you're solving for x and y, is no stress. It's free to deform in that dimension, and any strain is accepted without resistance. Plane strain, perpendicular, perpendicular dimension, has zero strain. It can't deform. This would be more the case if the the plane that you're looking at is a section of something that's actually really long in Z out of the plane, much longer than it is in X and Y. And so uh, it, it can't actually move there. Or if you've got a thin object, but it's sandwiched between things that are much stiffer than itself, it can't actually strain in the out of the page direction, the Z direction. That's what I'm trying to show with this angle. So in an isotropic, I guess, X, Y, and then Z is sort of down this way. Yeah, so uh, that's, the, that's when you would use plane strain if it can't move in Z. So just rewriting these in equations, here's our plane stress condition. We've got no stress in the z direction. And in the uh, and in plane strain, we've got no strain in the z direction. Now, if, we, if we're in plane stress here, we don't really care about what the z strain is a lot of the time. So we're just trying to solve the two-dimensional problem. So we can just focus on the top left part of this matrix and just say that epsilon x epsilon y is equal to 1 over e times this top corner of the matrix and then solve a two-dimensional problem. 
If you need to find epsilon z for some reason later, you can just use this equation once you've uh, solved for your stresses in x and y. The plane strain condition, on the other hand, doesn't let you immediately chop off some of this matrix because the, the zero is on the other side. What we, what we can do is write this using the stiffness matrix instead. So the stiffness matrix, again, is this inverted one that we found earlier, where we've got what the stresses are in terms of the, uh, in terms of the matrix times the strain. And now we can just chop off the bottom and right components of the matrix to get what the stresses are. If we still wanted to get an expression for the strains in terms of the stresses, now we're free to just invert this matrix. Doing that with maple, we come up with strains in terms of the stresses for the plain stress, uh, plain strain condition. So this was the plain stress condition again, plain strain condition. Okay, now let's compare the two conditions. Uh, looking at this one and this one, you see that the off-axis components here are larger, but the on-axis components are smaller. So what does that what does that mean? Since this is a compliance matrix, the off-axis components being larger means that they uh, we've got more compliant off-axis coupling, so y to x and vice versa. But we've got uh, we've got stiffer on-axis coupling, x to x and y to y. This is maybe not surprising. If we fix the material so that it can't move in Z, then applying an X stress would have caused some uh, additional motion in Z. But since we're stopping that, it's, uh, it's more difficult to do that. Now the Y coupling is a little bit weirder to think about. So what, what more compliant from Y to X means is that a Y stress causes more motion in X. That's because a Y stress would have caused motion in Z and X, but because it can't cause any in Z, it causes extra in X. So this kind of, this kind of makes sense if you think about it in terms of what we're really constraining there in the plane, uh, plane strain condition. Final example for today. Above, we found that with Y and Z fixed, the effective Young's modulus in X, which is the stress over the strain in X, is larger by this factor in front. Now that we've worked out the plane strain formulas, see if you can figure out the effective stiffness in X with Z fixed and Y free. So all we need to do is take the plane strain result that we got here and substitute in sigma Y is zero and then look at the ratio of sigma X to epsilon X. Doing exactly that, we come up with an effective stiffness of the Young's modulus divided by this factor. So let's uh, let's compare these. How much how much uh, more stiff is the material if both the other axes are fixed than if just z is fixed but y is free? Well, in the small Young's modulus limit, it's about twice as stiff. But as we start to increase it, having both axes fixed makes a much bigger difference. 